book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 3 here this morning. Uh, and if you recall from uh, last week, um, we got to examine a, a summary of, of Luke's concerning uh, this new body of, uh, of believers in Jesus Christ and some of the things that they're doing, and uh, we'll, we'll recap that here in just a minute. But uh, uh, the overall theme of, of Acts that we're kind of uh, looking at here is uh, Jesus continued, His continued work, His continued uh, ministry uh, through uh, kind of at first His apostles, but that expands to ultimately His church. And this morning, we're going to see that Jesus' work continues. He's not done. What He has started in His earthly ministry didn't end when He ascended. And we're going to see that Jesus continues to work and His power continues to work uh, in and through people today. So again, last week, we looked at this summary at the end of chapter 2 and what we noticed was that it's all concerning unity. Everything that Luke describes is an emphasis or describing the unity of this church. Now, again, some of the specific things to that church that unify that church, we can kind of bring to our world today, but there's no commands. There's no uh, instruction from any of the apostles or anything that Luke writes that would suggest that, you know, we have to practice the same things in the exact same way. But a lot of the principles that we see laid out there, a lot of things that the early church is doing at the end of chapter 2 are good things to practice. And if we kind of step back and kind of look at the principles happening there, there are things that we ought to practice as well to bring about unity. We see people enjoying each other's company. And something that we really emphasized last week is that they enjoyed each other's company without anything separating them. Class, status in society didn't separate them. The rich ate with the poor. There were likely shepherds who belonged to that same community. And they're, the, they're kind of like the lowlifes of society. No one likes shepherds. But yet, this, this congregation of people, because they're all in Christ, there's no discrimination whatsoever. They eat in each other's homes. They enjoy each other's company. They, they, the rich seem to sell things. Their, their own private possessions or their own goods. And they give to who, those who are in need. And so we see a community that is all about being together, being unified. They share meals together. And again, in in this society, in Jewish culture, uh, the people that you ate with mattered. It spoke to who you are as a person. And we see this in Jesus' ministry when He eats with those sinners People around Jesus are, 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 are astonished. Like, why would you associate? Why would you go to a table with those people eating? Do you not care about your own reputation? Do you not care about your own status, your own cleanliness, more so in their culture? But there is nothing that Luke here describes at the end of chapter 2 that would signify that there's any type of discrimination. They are all enjoying each other's company. They're unified together. They're astonished at many of the signs that the apostles are performing. And as we talked about last week, this this summary of Luke's about the early church here serves kind of as a transition. It's going to take us from one narrative to another. And so as the end of chapter 2 mentions that everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, here in chapter 3 we get to see at least one of those many signs and wonders that they're all in awe about. Before we dive in, let me just ask this question, or a couple questions here. What are miracles today? How would you kind of define that? Or how would you recognize one if you saw one? 
And so just think about that. Ponder that for a moment. In the ancient world, you know, uh, they didn't have our modern technology of medicine and things. And so, you know, a person who couldn't walk, all of a sudden walking, that is a miracle. That is the power of God working. We see other types of miracles, not just healing miracles. We see exorcisms take place. We see, even in the Old Testament, miracles take place where um, the uh, prophet Elijah uh, is, is taken care of when he is in need. We see um, uh, back there uh, the, the woman and her son are provided for by way of miracle uh, and things. Jesus performs a miracle, turning water into wine, um, you know. These are all miracles, and they all happen astonishingly and wondrously, and and of course, you know, there's no modern technology, and it's kind of hard for us to kind of, in some ways, define a miracle today because because of technology. You know, we we get sick, and, and, you know, uh, we might get really sick, and all of a sudden, you know, we, we go to the hospital, doctors diagnose us, uh, and, and because of medicine and, and, you know, the tools that we have today, we get, we get healed. And the question is, well, was that the medicine or was that God or a combination? Was this a miracle that actually took place? Because for you to be sick in the ancient world, like really sick, like near death sick, and you kind of regain life, that's a miracle. But today, do we really see things in that way? And our, our technology, for as wonderful it is, kind of muddies those waters. We might actually miss some things, or we might misapply things. I, I'm not sure if there's any harm calling something a miracle. If you know, if if there's a healing through medicine, you know, if you declare something a miracle, even though it might not necessarily be miraculous, that might not necessarily be wrong. But uh, again, it's it's not necessarily something clearly defined for us today. But maybe more importantly, there's been a moment in your life, or maybe there will be a moment or in your life, or maybe you just need to kind of imagine this, as it were, but what if you actually saw a real miracle? How would you react? How would you react? Praising God? Hopefully that's one of the responses, but... Uh, uh, I, can, I can attest, uh, I don't know if I've actually witnessed a, a true miracle of God or not in my life, but there have some things that have happened in my life where I'm just utterly speechless. And my, my jaw's on the floor, and I'm like, I, I can't believe that. How did that just happen? And just like Luke describes here for us that they're all in awe and at the wonders and signs that the apostles are doing. I've had those moments in my life, and you've likely had them too, where you're just, you're just in awe. And then kind of when you finally regain out of that astonishment mode, you, what ends up happening usually, at least for us as Christians, we usually praise God. And we're going to see some of that. We're going to see that very thing here. Uh, in our text this morning. So will you go to chapter 3 with me as we look at verses 1 through 10 here. And I had a really big wrestling match this week a little bit of, of how much of the text to cover because what takes place in verses 1 through 10 is not the end of the, of the narrative. It's not the end of this scene as it were. It continues on where Peter gives a, a sermon, a speech explaining what happens. So by kind of just doing verses 1 through 10, we don't necessarily grasp uh, the full idea of what's happening here because we need Peter's explanation of what's taking place. So next Sunday, we're going to dive into that, and, and it's a little bit more, it's going to take a little bit more time to kind of study through, uh, and so that's why I've ultimately decided to break it up, but uh, we might be repeating some things that we learned here this week, next week as well. So But there is something important to kind of take a look at here uh, through what happens in these first 10 verses. So will you follow along with me? One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. 
Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And Peter said, look at us. So the man gave his attention. The man gave his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped uh, to his feet and began to walk. And then he went walking or with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word this morning. So before we dive in any further, let's go to the Lord and ask for his help here this morning. Father, we thank you for this time that we can be in your word. And Father, as we take a look at this incredible moment, this miracle, Help us to see what is going on, what this miracle might mean. So, Father, we ask that you be with us, and it's in Jesus' awesome and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, let's set the scene here a little bit. If you're not too familiar with um, uh, the layout of the city of Jerusalem at the time of the Apostles, uh, and the layout of the temple, you can kind of get a little lost And um, um, if you have a great imagination, you might be able to be thinking about these things and and seeing these things vividly. Maybe if you've been there, you you can see these things very vividly. Uh, For me, who lacks imagination and and has never been there, it's kind of hard for me to kind of grasp these things. So let me just take you through a little bit here of uh, some of the things going on as we set the scene here. Peter and John, they're on their way to the temple. And in order to get there, they have to go up to the temple mount. Okay? Now remember, the city of Jerusalem sits on top of a mountain, and, and uh, kind of the peak of the mountain is where the temple sits. And uh, what you're seeing there in this picture is Herod's temple. We refer to it as Herod's temple because he is the one that built it, Herod the Great. Uh, the same one who tried to kill the, the baby Jesus. He's the one who built this magnificent temple. He actually built a lot of magnificent things throughout Israel. And uh, uh, some of those things you can still go and visit and see today. The picture you're actually looking at, and uh, I don't know, Scott, did you actually go see this thing? There is a big, giant model of New Testament Jerusalem that uh, you can go visit and walk around and, and see. One-tenth. One-tenth scale. Uh, And that's some of these pictures are looking at that model. And so this is the temple uh, inside what is kind of considered the the temple complex, as it were. And uh, he made this thing way bigger than what Solomon's temple was. This thing is huge uh, comparatively to the previous temples that Israel had constructed And so Peter and John, they're on their way to the temple because it's time for prayer. And as you can see, you kind of go up to the temple mount. Uh, The city there sits behind the temple, and you can kind of see how it's a little bit lower. Perhaps in this picture, you can see a little bit better. Um, uh, The city sits kind of below the temple mount. So when the text actually says that they go up to the temple, they're actually going up to the temple. Maybe this picture might be uh, a little bit better as well. You can see all the staircases. You can see uh, the ramps that get you up to that temple mount. So again, you know, this is a fine point of the text, but uh, an honest one. In your imagination, they're, they're actually in the city and they're going up to the temple mount. So we even get these interesting details from the text. Uh, the time of the day is the ninth hour. Uh, which is three in the afternoon. The mention of three in the afternoon is a note from Luke here for those who don't know the Jewish sunrise schedule. Uh, This time of prayer was the second of two key prayer times, the first being at nine in the morning. Uh, This was also the time uh, in the afternoon where they would offer the Tamid, 
uh, offering, which was a continuous burnt offering. If you go back and look at Exodus 39, um, 39 or Numbers 28, verses 3 and 4, uh, you get a description of this ongoing burnt offering. And so this was the time of the afternoon where many in, in the city would come into the temple and they would pray as they would offer uh, this offering on the uh, burning altar. Now, all of a sudden here in the text, Luke shifts our attention to another locale around the temple, to the gate called Beautiful or Beautiful Gate, where a lame man is placed day after day to try to collect alms. For the lame man, this was probably a good place to be. Charity was something that was important in Jewish culture, and it's likely that people would be especially charitable as they walk into the temple to pray. Uh, charity, taking care of the poor, taking care of those who uh, were lame uh, or sick or something. That was something that God instructed in the Old Testament and uh, through the law. And so uh, a good place to be, if you could be there, is, is right there at the temple because you're, you're walking into the temple to worship God and all of a sudden you see this, this person there asking for money and you're going to be convicted like, Boy, God commands me, how can I go in and, and face God if I don't show some charity? So it was probably a good place to be. You would throw uh, a few alms there uh, to the lame man as you would go in. Uh, so it was probably a good place for the lame man to be. Now, Luke mentions this beautiful gate. And you might ask, what gate is that? That is a hard question to answer because Luke is the only one who ever refers to a gate of the temple as beautiful. No other ancient source ever refers to any of these gates as, as the beautiful gate. And there are anywhere from 8 to 12 to 16 gates, uh, depending if you're talking about the temple itself or the temple mount, uh, the temple complex, complex as a whole. Um, there's a lot of gates and so what gate might Luke be referring to? Well, Christian tradition here, Christian tradition says that uh, it possibly is considered the Shushan Gate. The Shushan Gate. Uh, and in the picture behind me, uh, for those at home probably won't be able to get to see my uh, cool pointing skills here this morning. Um, uh, but uh, for everyone here, uh, you get a treat at... Uh, my ability to point at things here. Um, so you have the temple complex here. And uh, let me try to get out of everyone's way here. Um, you have right here, this is kind of known as the Shushan Gate or Golden Gate. This gate actually points away from the city. It points towards Gethsemane. Oops. Okay. Uh, some other things that are important to understand here, this courtyard out here, this courtyard out here is known as the, the, the courtyard of the Gentiles. Uh, you get inside the temple right here. This is the courtyard of women. And then inside here, you have the courtyard of uh, priests. Uh, this is where the burning altar would be. Um, uh, and then the actual temple itself is this big center structure right here. And uh, Christian tradition, anyway, says that it could have been the Shushan Gate. The problem with the Shushan Gate, again, is that it's something that points outside the city. So this is likely not the gate that Peter and John would have gone to to get into the temple complex. It was also a gate that wasn't very widely traveled. It wasn't a temple that was very widely traveled. So it is very unlikely that, that this is the gate that we find the lame man, that Luke describes as the beautiful gate. Um, here's a map of the city. As you can see here, you have the temple complex right here. And um, you have the Shushan Gate right there. And look at where it points. It points out towards Gethsemane, out towards the, where the city, with the city sitting back here. So if John and Peter are coming from the city anywhere in here, uh, they're not going all the way into the valley to get up the hill to take the, the bridge or whatever. Uh, to get over to the Shushan Gate. So, uh, Christian tradition, likely wrong at this point, um, based on what we kind of know today. 
Well, there is another gate that is kind of traditionally, uh, you'll, as you look at maps and things, you're going to see this gate as the one labeled the beautiful gate. And this gate is the gate that separates the, the courtyard of the Gentiles from the courtyard of women. As you can see, they put beautiful gate right there by the, by the gate. Uh, zooming out a little bit, you kind of see that it's, uh, it's part of this inner complex. Remember, you got the, the rest of the temple complex all the way out here, the, the courtyard of Gentiles uh, and things like that. And uh, uh, on your maps and things, like uh, this, this picture actually comes out of this little pamphlet right here by Rose Publishing that talks about the temple. Um, it, uh, uh, they label this as the beautiful gate. Slight problem. From what I can find in other places, this gate actually doesn't have a name. And this is the gate that we, we just kind of are ourselves in our modern day have kind of labeled as the beautiful gate. And uh, um, a lot of the gates actually have names, but there's nothing that I could find that would suggest that this gate was all that beautiful. Uh, as you can kind of see, it just seems their, their depiction of it is just a wall with a couple of big doors in the middle of it. There's nothing spectacular or beautiful about it. But it is a possibility. We, we can't know this for sure, so to really argue over these things uh, is pointless. But again, we're trying to get a visual of what the setting looks like, what Peter and John are, are heading into, where this lame man sits. And so it's just best to go with my suggestion and, 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 um, and just think that I'm right. Um, it's possible that the gate that they consider, or Luke considers beautiful, is what is called the, the uh, Nicor Gate if I'm saying that right. Um, this gate was beautiful. It was all constructed out of Corinthian brass or bronze. Uh, it was adorned with silver and gold. It had many reliefs, lots of color from plants and things. And as you can see from their rendering of the thing, it's a gigantic doorway. And it has pillars. And it was beautiful. But again, we can't know with actual certainty. Uh, but this gate does seem to be something that could have been described as beautiful. And actually, a lot of scholars, despite kind of what some of the, the publishers have put out, a lot of scholars think that this is the gate. This is the gate, again, that separates the courtyard of women from the courtyard of priests. And so it would be on these grand stairs somewhere, maybe by one of the pillars, where our lame man has been put. And this is the, the steps that Peter and John are going up and going through when they take notice of him. So as our text continues, Luke now brings all the characters together, mentioning that the lame man saw Peter and John and asked them for alms. When Peter and John take notice of the man while they are entering the temple, Peter demands the lame man to look at them. Now again, I'm not entirely sure why the lame man who apparently kind of, uh, as the way Luke narrates this, the, the lame man is, is sitting there asking for alms, but there's something about Peter and John that captures his attention, and so he's looking at them and, and hoping that, that they'll see him, and then Peter and John all of a sudden do take notice of this man. And they go over to him. And now Peter and John are demanding for him to give him his attention, the lame man. Now again, uh, I don't know if it maybe it's shame or whatever or, or improper for the lame man to, to uh, look at you know, the person who he thinks he's going to get something. But, but, as, but as Luke narrates this, what Luke tells us is that as the lame man looks intently at Peter and John, he has this expectation that he's going to get something from them. And likely, his whole purpose of being there to getting money is that he's hoping that, wow, I've gotten their attention. They want my attention. This, this is going to be good. I'm going to get something really nice. This is going to be a lot of money. 
Now again, that might be reading a little too much into the motives of the lame man, as, as Luke doesn't say too much, other than that he has this anxious expectation that he's going to get something from them. And it is is anytime you run into Jesus, anytime you run into Jesus' followers, what Jesus has to offer is not always what's expected. And so they are looking at each other intently. And the lame man now gives, uh, as he gives Peter and John his full attention with the anticipation that he's going to get something. Um, It's interesting to note here. Did you notice a text? Look at verse 6 real quick. Look at verse 6. What conjunction word sits there for most of your translations? But? Did I hear a but? Yeah, you, you have a but. My translation says, then Peter said. I think that's kind of disappointing that the NIV 2011 update did that. But, no, there's an actual conjunction there in the Greek, and it can be translated as but. In other words, Luke is all of a sudden signaling for the, for the reader, for the audience, listening or, or, or watching this story unfold. It's not going to be what the lame man expects. Because it's a but. But then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. I mean, can you imagine you know, the buildup going on right now? The lame man, he, he's looking into the, the faces of John and, and Peter. And, and he probably has some great expectations that something really good is going to come. And, and all of a sudden, out of Peter's lips goes, I don't have any gold or silver. How devastated might this guy be? You know how many people just passed us going into the temple while we're staring at each other? You've cost me money. So as soon as he hears that, he likely could be extremely disappointed. But Peter continues, But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, walk. I don't know if the guy felt something weird happen as soon as he said that. I don't know know, what might be going through the lame man's mind when he hears that. It could have been that he felt nothing. And here all of a sudden Peter, who who grabs his right hand and, and starts to pull him up, if the lame man is going, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? I can't walk. And Luke even tells us that the guy can't walk from when? From birth, from the womb. This man has never been able to walk. He's always been lame. Again, Luke doesn't give these details. Is it it something like, did the lame man all of a sudden feel something? Go, wait a minute, something's different. Let's try this. Or did he like, why are you grabbing my hand? Why are you trying to get me up? And I tend to lean towards the idea here that the lame man might be a little resistant to what Peter is trying to do. Because in the text, verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. It wasn't until the man got up off the ground until his limbs got strength. And so as Peter is pulling this guy up, he's probably like, what in the world are you doing? Why in the world did you say get up and walk? That's not going to happen. That can't happen. I've been this way since I was born. What are you trying to do? But as soon as Peter and John are able to get this man up on his feet, the man's feet and ankles became strong. They now worked Verse 8, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. He, he leapt. He couldn't believe what has now happened. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. And then he went with uh, them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. I'm sure for all of his years, he's watched people walk and jump. My question is, how in the world does he know how to do those things? <laughs> After you know how many years of being lame? He is jumping. He is walking. This is an incredible 
incredible miracle that has taken place. An incredible miracle that has taken place. His response is, of course, totally appropriate and likely how we might react. Leaping and jumping and praising God. And everyone around was amazed. And they're starting to recognize, you know, you're going into the temple. Most people, as they walk into church, this is probably similar, similar experience as you walked into church. Were any of you leaping? Were, were any of you like just so excited to be here that you're jumping up and down? Now I know there's snow, so you're probably not doing that. But even in the summer, are you jumping and leaping to get in here? Most people, when they're in the routine of their, of their normal day of worship, they're probably walking to the temple just going, yep, yeah, okay, I'm going to go pray now. Just focused on that, walking into the temple. And all of a sudden, here comes this man, jumping and leaping, ecstatic and praising God. He's probably, knowing Jewish culture, he's probably a little loud and excited. And all of a sudden, the people in the temple courts are going to be looking at this guy going, what is going on? Why is he doing that? And then as Luke tells us, they start to recognize that this is the lame man who sat outside. Now it's likely, depending on which gate he was at, it's likely that either it was a social custom or social pressure or simply because he was lame, in other words, he's broken, he's defiled, he may not have been able to go into wherever Peter and John were headed. But now that he's been made whole, now that he's been, quote unquote, clean, he can enter. He's probably never gone in before. And he is just ecstatic. He is, he is joyous. He's praising God. He's making a commotion and everyone's looking around going, what? And, they're, and, and as soon as they start to recognize who this guy is, they become amazed. And they're wondering. And this is an opportunity that we're going to see next week where Peter seizes he seizes this incredible opportunity where people are now paying attention. He's going to explain why this happened and how this happened. That's the rest of the story that we're going to unpack next week. But for this morning, the impact for us is that we get to see that Jesus' work continues. You notice what Peter said to him? Peter didn't say, I command you to stand. Peter didn't say, stand up and walk. There's only one person that we saw in the biblical story that could command people to do the impossible. And that is Jesus Christ. Remember the story? This is in Luke as well. Remember the story? And this is gonna, there's some shadowing here going on uh, to look back to Luke's gospel. Remember the friends of the lame person that they, they ripped a hole in someone's roof and they lowered their friend down there in front of Jesus? And Jesus says, You know, your sins are forgiven. And everyone's like, Whoa, like, you can't do that. You're not God. And Jesus is like, well, is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or for you to, uh, or for me to say, hey, grab your mat, get up and walk? And it's what Jesus does. He tells the lame man, stand up, roll up your mat, and walk. Now, we don't see that from Peter. Peter says, in the name of Jesus, walk. So very clearly, we see that this is not Peter's power. This is not John's power. This is Christ's power. We see Christ continuing to work. Even though he's no longer physically present. His power still goes forward through these apostles. And ultimately through his church. Now that raises some Incredible questions. Why don't we see this stuff happening today? Why is it that none of us really have the ability or power to go and look at the lame people in this world and go, hey, in the name of Jesus, boom, you're healed. There's been a couple times 
There's been a couple times in this church where, where people have called upon the elders to come out and pray for someone. And we pray and pray. And, and, and you know, to be honest with you, my expectation is, is that because Jesus can do these things, because Jesus has this power, boom, this is going to work. They're going to be healed and, and things are going to be awesome again. I was disappointed. Apparently, you know, the elders and I don't have that kind of power. Frankly, if we had that kind of power, it'd be kind of scary. I'd probably be going around and be like, look at me. I can do these incredible cool things. To be honest with you, I don't know why. And I wrestle with that sometimes. Just as Bobby shared with us uh, uh, why, you know, we ask these questions, why? Why do these bad things happen in this world? Why does God do all these incredible miracles of healing? And, and here's a person that I extremely love and I care about and, and, I, and I put my hands on them and I just say, God, heal them. Do something. You have the power. And nothing happens. I wrestle with that too. And I don't have a satisfactory answer as to why sometimes we can't do those things. But nonetheless, I know that Jesus' power is still working. People are still being healed. Jesus is still working to restore people. Not just spiritually. Of course, when people put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they're restored spiritually. But He is still working to restore people physically. Is it through modern medicine? Is it through people? It, these, these things I, I scratch my head on too, just to be honest with you. I don't, I, I don't know how to fully explain these things. I can tell you that God loves us, that God cares for us. I can tell you that, again, that God does do the miraculous things uh, it, it, from time to time through, through Christ and His work, continued work. I've heard stories of miracles, again, not just healing ones. Uh, there's a, I've shared this with you a few times. I heard a, a missionary once uh, in the Amazon. Uh, each tribe apparently speaks you know, different languages as you move up the river and things. And, and they believe that God was calling them to move up river, but no one knew how to speak the language. But then by way of miracle, they are able to communicate the gospel to the tr next tribe up the river when no one knew how to talk to them or speak to them. That seems pretty miraculous. I can tell you that even in Jesus' day during His ministry, He didn't heal every single sick person that there was. He healed a lot of people, but there were probably still lots more who never were healed. This is part of the mystery of God. This is part of, of how, how God confounds us and and, and, and if, if we start trying to label and figure things out, we kind of miss the point. Like, okay, why, why didn't God heal that person? Hmm, maybe there's some secret sin and they don't deserve it. Or maybe, maybe that person just simply isn't good enough. That's all lies. The true reality is, is that we don't know why, but when God acts, when Jesus, we see Jesus' healing power in this world, what is to be the response? Praise. Worship. Maybe some jumping around. We know that God cares for us. We know that God loves us. And even though God may not choose to act to bring healing to the people we love and care about or even ourselves in this world now, there is an incredible promise that has been given to us that one day in the future at some point, Jesus returns. He finishes His work and establishes His kingdom in all the bad is thrown away. And we will all physically be restored. 
And it seems that the New Testament's purpose is focusing on that promise rather than trying to figure out why God heals some people and not others. It's to focus on the promise that one day we all will receive it. Some people got to get it now. Some people get to be restored physically now. This lame man got to be physically restored now. We don't know the rest of his story. We don't know the rest of his story. Maybe the next day he goes back, he's so excited, he falls off the edge and breaks his legs. I don't know. Like maybe he only got to enjoy it for a day. Probably not, but you never, you never know. But this is, this, we, just, we just think that, why doesn't this happen to me or happen to the people I care about? And we have to step past that. And when God acts and does a miracle, we praise Him. And if He doesn't act and the miracle doesn't come, we still have the promise. We've been conditioned. We have been trained by our culture, our society, to to have things our way and to have them now. And we get incredibly frustrated or angry or, or bent sideways when we don't have what we want now. You read the New Testament, you even read the Old Testament, it's not necessarily about now. It's about what is to come. And there will be a day when God fulfills His promise in the work of Jesus Christ, establishing eternity where all people are restored. And so the impact, again for us this morning, is that Jesus' work continues. And we can be praising God for that. And we can be hopeful, we can be praying that Jesus' work would continue to even impact us in this way. But even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't, we know that all who are in Christ will receive that miracle of restoration when Christ returns. And so for us, let us be focused on that promise. And not worry about why did that person get healed and the other person not. But to focus that for all of us who are in Christ, we will all one day be restored. Fully, physically. That's going to be an incredible day. That's going to be an awesome day. And so let us continue to hope and persevere until that day. Now there's more to say again about this. Peter's going to give us again, as we mentioned next week, he's going to, he's going to give a message and it's going to point to Christ and what this means more fully. But for now, let us praise God that He did this incredible thing for this man. And let us look to the promise that we have through the continued work of Jesus Christ for that day to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this time to to be in Your Word, to explore and to be encouraged. We thank you that, Lord Christ, that your work continues, that you continue to make an impact in this world. There's nothing in this text, and there's nothing in your word that says that you stop working. So, Father, we know that your miracles still take place. Some of them are maybe quiet and small, Some of them are huge. And we might not always recognize them, but Father, we know that through Christ, you are still working. We give you great praise. Thank you for the incredible promise that you have given us that one day we will all be restored. We will not be wrestling with pandemics, with cancer, with heart disease. We won't be wrestling, fighting, any of these things. We'll be fully restored. 
to live in eternity with you. We give you great praise for this incredible promise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.